Guys, welcome to the Dad Edge Podcast. I'm Larry Hagner, your host and founder of this show. Got a great show lined up for you today from my good friend who is the best-selling author of On Fire and now the new book, In Awe, and his name is John O'Leary. You guys have probably heard John O'Leary. He's He is big, big time, big time. What you don't know is that John and I actually graduated high school together. Not just the same high school, but the same class. I spent, I had the honor of spending four years in high school with John O'Leary. And now to see him doing things that is literally changing the world, I mean, it's pretty awesome to watch that from a man you used to, you know, study social studies with together. <laughs> if you guys don't know who John Larry is, John Larry, when he when he was nine years old, he was in a horrific accident. It, he was burned on nearly 100% of his body at nine years old in a house fire. Uh, he had minimal chance of survival, but somehow he would defy the odds and make nearly a full recovery. A lot of the things he has learned over the years by overcoming adversity, he has literally taken the world by storm with his story, with his inspiration and things that he has learned. He has delivered his message to over 1 million people in 14 countries, 1,600 events, including Lego, Southwest Airline, Microsoft, Pepsi, the St. Louis Cardinals, and many, many more. So in 2016, he shared his story in the number one national best-selling book, like I said, On Fire. He also has a podcast called The Live Inspired Podcast, which is downloaded, is it's been downloaded over two million times. So the reason I had John on the show today was because he just launched a new book a few months ago called In Awe: Rediscover Your Childlike Wonder to Unleash Inspiration, Meaning, Joy. I mean, it's it's unreal. It's an unreal book. What he does in this book is he actually shares lessons learned by his four kids. So he's another four, father of four. So four kids as well. And what you're going to hear in today's particular show is how we can be more curious, like a child, how we can be more creative, how we can ask ourselves better questions, how we can even get out of the victim mentality role of like, why is life happening to me versus choosing to step into maybe some adversity and some lessons learned and choosing to be the hero despite whatever the struggle is. So you're going to hear a lot of value today. Also, join me in John's In Awe 21-Day Challenge. Uh, right after this podcast was recorded, I stepped into that challenge. It is an absolute game changer. I'll have a link for you guys in the show notes for that as well. So gentlemen, no more talk for me. Here's my interview with the one, the only, the legend, the guy I got to go to high school with, John O'Leary. John O'Leary. What's up, brother? Man, Larry, it's good to be back. I, I, it's it's a season for me where I'm doing a lot of interviews, a lot of podcasts, and yet I don't know a whole lot of the guys on the other side of the microphone or camera. So today to have a friend on the other side, it's uh, it's an honor, man. So thank you for having me on. Well, dude, for me, this is, this is surreal. I don't know how many people know this. We're actually streaming this live through our data group on Facebook. We've got thousands of guys there who are watching right now, as long as through our podcast. And it just so happens, John, that I have this nice hum of the lawnmower going in the background, which is like perfect timing. But it is, it's all perfect timing. So your, your job in life is to say, to say yes. Yeah. So I uh, keep saying yes to the lawnmower and to everything else there. And we got this. That's right. That's right. But Hey, I don't know how many people know this. Uh, you and I went to high school together, not just went to high school together. We graduated in the same class together. It's a big deal, man. It's, it it's one of our claims to fame. So we need to reach a little bit higher, but yes, I <laughs> love my time in high school. And you know, you look back in your life and you're not sure where you're going, but you recognize only in looking back that how, how instrumental some of the seemingly insignificant individuals, teachers experiences were and just without a doubt shaped me into the guy that I became. Yeah, it was really cool. I mean, I got you and I kind of knew each other from a distance. And I always looked at you as um, just this guy who I mean, you know, just so happens that's the name of your brand and your podcast. I just remember you just being a very inspiring person. I don't know if you remember this or not. But we went to a retreat at the White House. I think it was junior or senior year. And you and I, we, we were in a group 
uh, of guys. And we had to, we were put in groups where we specifically had to choose people we didn't know very well, but we wanted to get to know well. Uh, you were in my groups. I, there was an opportunity for us in junior, for, I think it was our junior year, that I really got to know you and, and just found out more about your life and, and things that had you excited even at that age. And you know, I just remember seeing you in high school and I was like, man, that, that guy's going to do something big. I don't know what it is, but he's going to do something big. And it's so cool to see what you're doing and the ripples you're making in the world. But just to add some context, um, I know your story. <laughs> I love your story. Um, but let's, let's go back to when you were nine years old and just give the audience some context for maybe the one or two people who haven't heard of you or haven't listened to the previous show. So just to stumble into that question, when I was 17 or 18 and Larry sees a guy who's going to go on and do things that are big, the guy he saw that in did not see it in himself. And so I lacked confidence in high school, lacked it in college, lacked it after graduating, lacked it in building up businesses and really only began to grasp a little bit of confidence at age like 28. I'm still faking it to make it here at 43, but at age 28, when I began to embrace my scars, my story, the experiences, and what happened to me as a kid as not being a negative. Because for me, Larry, and our listeners, the story that changed my life at first for the worse and now for the far better was at age nine, I got burned in a house fire on 100% of my body. So for those that are listening to my voice, you're like, all right, what does that mean? For those that see my face right now on video, from my neck to my toes, it's third degree. And on my face, it was second degree burn, which is like a horrible sunburn. But for my entire body, from my neck to my toes, it is third degree. I've lost my fingers on both hands, spent five months in hospital, years in surgery and therapy, and had a lifetime of some challenges. And we can spend as much time within those years, Larry, as you'd like, but it's not the kind of story when you're going through it, you hope to someday talk about. It's not the kind of pictures that you hope to one day show in front of strangers as something you went through. Instead, I, I did my very best in grade school, middle school, and high school to act as if nothing had ever happened to me, to pretend like my fingers weren't missing, to pretend like my body wasn't burned. And so I, I saw nothing extraordinary in myself at all. I tried to cover up. I can imagine. And I, if we're speaking to the audience, men in particular, we're, there's a lot of shame sometimes in our scars and how that even shows up, whether, you, whether they're physical scars, emotional scars, mental scars. Um, we even like to hide our adversity. I always say this on the show, but every, every answer, every question we ever, we ever give is fine and good and good and fine. You could literally be going through hell on earth, but you'll tell everyone that everything's good and fine. But for you, you've really taken this um, as, as, as such, a, such a moment of embracing what it is you struggle with most. And even you sharing just very authentically, like, hey, that, like, I didn't have confidence in myself. And it wasn't until I embraced this. Um, I do want you to share one story, though. Uh, and, I, and I just think it's, it's, it's so, man, it's going to get me emotional just talking about it. It's so inspiring because when this happened to you, your biggest fear was that your dad was going to be mad at you. And your dad came to you in that room where you were in the hospital and you guys had a conversation. And even as I reflect on that conversation, I, I, I'm getting a little choked up. Would you mind sharing that? I would love to. And, and I had an interview earlier today and the gentleman said, I understand your dad's a great influence in your life. Can you share with me why? And I'm not always lost for words, but when you have a guy as saintly, as dynamic, as, as much of a lion in a positive way as my father is, it's hard for me to draw just one. I mean, this is a man who, he's a veteran. He went grade school, middle school, high school, college, and law school without missing a single day of school. He just loves to go. He loves to be engaged. He loves to show up. He loves to be on the move. And then he gets Parkinson's disease later on in life. And now, Larry, for 30 years, he's been completely just disabled by this. But I've seen my dad on top of the world, and I've seen him beat down by it. And in both seasons, he's smiling. Always. So dad's listening right now. There's, your kids are watching. They're watching not only how you handle business when you're rocking and rolling success, but they're certainly watching right now when many of us are struggling. So give them an example that is worthy. And, and for my myself as a little boy, the most meaningful thing my dad maybe ever did for me is at age nine, I'm in the hospital room. My father's a business owner. He's type A, somewhat driven. I just burned down his house. 
because I was the one playing with fire and gasoline and I'm the one that caused the explosion and I'm the one that caused these scars on my body. And I knew it was all my fault. And I knew my dad was going to be furious. So I hear his voice down the hall and he's speaking to a nurse. And the question my dad asked was, where is my boy, John? Where is my boy, John? And Larry, I'm nine years old and I'm in this room thinking, oh my gosh, the old man has come to finish me off. You know, this thing is over. These nurses are wasting their time. And one of them brings him back into this room. She pulls back the curtain. The lion roars into this room. And, and I'll never forget what he said. He said, John, my little monkey, look at me. So I look up at him and he goes, look at me when I'm talking to you one more time. He goes, I have never been so proud of anybody in my entire life. And my little buddy, you look at me when I'm talking to you. I'm just proud today to be your dad. And then this wonderful man says, I love you. I love you. I love you. And as a nine-year-old Larry, I remember thinking, oh my gosh, nobody told my dad what happened. The, the old guy doesn't know. But as a father myself, and for you as a leader, and for our listeners right now who uh, have experienced not only getting love, but giving it, you realize that he understood what happened, but he also understood the gravitas of the moment that you can rebuild a home. Uh, insurance will cover some and the rest you can figure out a way to get around. But this life, man, the most important thing in front of him was something that maybe from time to time he may have missed. The beautiful thing about tragedy, though, is you come face to face with the things that actually matter. And one of the cool things ultimately that comes out of coronavirus 19 is it reminds us what actually matters and who actually matters. It forces us to slow down and take inventory of the things and the people that matter. So I experienced that not only during a pandemic, but I experienced it at age nine and watched my dad lead forward. Mm. So John, uh, thank you for choking me up again. Uh, <laughs> this is the second time now. <laughs> uh, what an incredible story of a father's love. And for those of us in the audience and, and me hosting included, what a powerful reminder of what it means to be a foundational rock in your child's life and to create a space of love will conquer all. Things can be replaced. And the one thing that I care about most is that you're okay. Mm. So I, I want to thank you. I want to acknowledge and appreciate you for that, for that very powerful reminder. Um, and, and for the, those of us who have any spiritual beliefs at all and, and, uh, all, there's room at the table for everybody. Mm -hmm. But in the Christian belief, there's a prayer like it's called the Our Father. Yeah. And a lot of scriptural s s experts have wondered why Our Father? It's, it's highly unlikely God has a beard or he's a white guy <laughs> up in space. Like that's probably not what's going on. So why would Jesus pray Our Father? And many believe it's because God saw ahead and realized how weak masculinity and men would become in time and, and that many mm -hmm. kids would need evidence of a, of a truly loving father because they may not see it on earth and yet dads and the room and moms and aunts and uncles, because you, you can take on this role of being a father as well. We, we need evidence of love and of grace and of forgiveness and of people who are willing not to tell us to rise to where they are, but have the audacity to come down to where we are. And my, my dad could have met me in a million different ways that day I burned down his house. And if he had met me in almost any other way, I'm not sure you and I are having this interview today. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm on the edge of life and death right then. And then love steps in and it changed me. So I just remind us, man, I mean, last year, Larry, 1.5 million Americans attempted suicide. Yeah. So let's not pretend like you have to get burned to be in a life death situation. Uh, -uh. Life puts us in the middle of that storm every single day and a father's love can bring us through it. Mm. Thank you again for another reminder. Appreciate that, man. Uh, your family now you have, uh, let me see, last time I counted, what, four, <laughs> right? You and I are the Showing up, man. There's pictures <laughs> behind me for those watching right now, but I have four kids, 12, yeah. 10, 8, and uh, 14, 12, 10, and 8. That's crazy, man. We're, we're like almost right there. We have 14, 12, 6, and 4. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and your wife, you and your wife have been married for how long now? Almost 17 years. And we're going to be married 17 years this year too. So um, I would love for you to share with us. First of all, let's talk about marriage first, then your kids. And then I obviously we're going to talk about your new book. I want to spend at least the next half of the show talking about that. What were some of the maybe life lessons that you learned from your own father 
or maybe some life lessons that you learned walking through what you did uh, with with the struggles and the adversity growing up. Uh, what are some key lessons you've learned about marriage and what are most important to you? So my dad was a great dad, first and foremost, because he was a phenomenal husband. Yeah. And I realized for many of us, we struggle in relationships. Many of us are no longer in a relationship. We're still a dad, but we're not with their mother at this point. And I, I really understand that. But I, I must say that I think my father was a remarkable dad because he was an awesome husband. He, he uh, had her back. They were on the same page. Totally different personalities. Completely different. So it wasn't like they were just yin and yang right on top, right on top of each other moving forward in life. I think many times he had to move his will a little bit to meet her where she was and, and sometimes vice versa. As far as where I saw leadership from my father's parenting, he's one of the most loving guys I know, always in a good mood, always optimistic, always faithful, but also always uh, bold enough to be real with his kids, with his wife and with those he loved. And my favorite story about my dad's authenticity is I was having a bit of a pity party. This is not in a book. So, uh, pull the chairs a little closer kids. Cause here we go. But I was having a little bit of a, a pity party and, and, uh, you know, I've lost my fingers, man. I'm scarred from my neck to my toes. I'm in a wheelchair. Life is not easy. Now I'm 10. I'm not back in school yet. And I'm just struggling. So that night, at, as I'm getting closer to going to bed, my dad is helping me like, take off some bandages and get on clothes for bed and all this other stuff. And I just kept saying, why me, dad? Why me? And unfair. This is nonsense. Dad, the other kids were playing with fire, too. And I just kept going on and on and on about why me? And finally, my father says, and he never cursed at all, but he said, damn it, John. Listen to me. This terrible thing has happened to you. And if you want, you can remain a victim to it for the rest of your life. And no one will ever blame you for that. Or, John, you can use this experience to jar others awake to what is possible in their lives. This is an opportunity. You don't have to see it as such, but you can. You can be a victim, victim or a victor. And then he said, it's your choice. Now, those were the final words he spoke to me that night as he's getting ready for bed. We say a little prayer. He kisses me goodnight and says, good night. I love you. He doesn't remember that conversation. He and I talked about this last week. He doesn't rem remember anything about it. I'll never forget it. So um, I don't know. Some, some of the conversations we have that are most influential in the lives of those around us aren't ones that we even remember having. And some of them, we don't even use words. But it's important that we be present enough to be in the room so that we can fight through the adversity we face when they're little and as they grow older, the issues become even bigger. And the need for a role model, a father figure, a mother for the ladies in the room, it's as important when they have facial hair as when they have diapers on. Ain't that the truth? Just a couple of reflections on that. Number one, your dad never necessarily gave you words around how to be a good husband or marriage. You just got to see it, which I think is great. So he walked the walk. So that's a big lesson. And it doesn't matter how old our kids are. Sometimes I think our kids, like we look at our kids like, oh, they're oblivious. They're into this or that or the other, but they are watching, man, they're watching. Uh, the other thing too is your dad didn't, in that conversation, John, your dad never shoulded on you. He never took a should on you. He gave you a choice. So he never said, hey, you should do this and you should do that. And your mind should be this. You're, you know, he basically said, John, here are the options. Right. And you can choose. And I think that's a really, really powerful way to communicate with your kid. Like, mm -hmm. hey, you've got A and you got B. And I even like the fact that he inserted the point of nobody probably blame you if you decided to go with this one. Right. However, you've got this opportunity. So kudos to him on that. They, one. They, and he's awesome. She, my yeah. mom is equal. And one thing, since you brought up your, your take on it, what they did, I think better than many parents, including the one you're currently interviewing is they frequently answered my questions with their questions back. <laughs> and most of the time we parents, we leaders look at politicians, man. When was the last time you saw any politician act like they don't know anything or, or for that matter, <clears throat> act as if they'd ever made a poor decision. Mm -hmm. Never happened. Not, not on my watch. And, and yet, what we all know is we're broken. We make mistakes all the time. We just don't see leaders who are examples of honesty, of humility, and of growth going forward in life. My mom and dad were exhibits A of that to me. And as kids, we would frequently ask them questions and they would follow up 
what do you think? And then walk out of the room and it's like, Dang. you know what my mom used to always do every Sunday morning, she would come in and uh, she'd say, you guys don't have to go to church today if you don't want, um, as, if you don't have anything to be grateful for, don't go. It's your choice. Let me know what you decide. And that was our way of like kind of scratching our head as little ones being like, ah, dang it, man. Like they got us again. Like we have to go because we do have so much to be grateful for. And they made it seem as if it was our decision when I think they wanted to lead us to water and then make us just thirsty enough to bend down and drink. I like that analogy. I'm going to, I'm going to steal that. We're going to quote that. (laughs) My parents are models of it. That's for sure. I like it. I like it. So we talked about marriage and John, I know the, the, the light of your life is this woman in your life. And what is, what is something you appreciate most about the relationship you have with her? Her humility. So her humility is what I said. And I had a book done for best 40th birthday where I was going to have 40 of her closest friends from every year along her life, write her a love letter. So it started with mom and dad and grandparents all the way up. And, and then I was going to have a picture. So imagine a picture of her at that age with the story on top of it from the person who knew her best at that age. So that's, that's what I came up with for her presence. And I was looking for 40. I think I got 52 people back. And so we had 52 pages and then I was page number 53. And uh, one word that surprised me in its frequency is humility. And then looking through my own marriage and that are, you know, to be honest with you, some of the successes that we've had as a couple, Beth just doesn't buy into success. She doesn't buy into her own physical beauty. She doesn't buy into bank accounts or followers on Facebook or podcast. She just doesn't care. It's so, she's so underwhelmed by that kind of stuff. And I find that so attractive. I didn't know I did until I kept seeing it in everybody else's letter to her, but they kept commenting on how beautiful she was in every way that word could, exa- could mean something for someone, physical, spiritual, character, everything. And how she didn't, she was like the last one to be aware of that. And that is true. She doesn't know she's all that. And, uh, you know, most of the social media stars of the day, they do know they're all that. And just watch because I'll show you in the next post too. <laughs> that's just not her, man. So I'm, I'm amazed by her, by her beauty, by her character, by her steadfastness. Uh, by her timeliness, like she's everything I'm not. And uh, I just, I'm more attracted to her now as we move towards 17 years than I was when I first met her. Mm, I love that, man. I, I tell my wife very similar things all the time. Like, she's like, why do you love me so much? I was like, I was like, if you only saw what I saw and everybody else sees around you, you'd be pretty shocked and, and pretty in awe. But she's same thing comes from a very humble background, you know, lots of humility, but that, that's, that is a rare trait, uh, especially, especially if you're in the limelight. Um, let's go ahead and get to your kids and then we'll get to your new book Four kids. I feel your pain, man. It's, yeah. it's a lot going on, especially, uh, I, <laughs> I've been joking that, uh, if you ever want to know what it's like to have four kids in quarantine, just imagine four drunk people that never leave your house right? <laughs> and they, they eat all your food. Uh, but what has it been like for you raising four other human beings and what has been maybe the most joyous thing that you have found in fatherhood and what have been some of the things that have challenged you the most? So I'll try to be honest with the second question when we get there, but I'll begin with the first. I wrote a book called In Awe. It came out last week. And the whole book is about what my kids have taught me. I mean, it's about leadership and marriage and growing top line revenue and, and being in flow and like everything that you would expect and hope to get from a leadership type book. But the origin story is really, man, I learned that by watching kids do life. And so uh, even the subtitle, Rediscover Your Childlike Wonder. Uh, to unleash inspiration, meaning, and joy. Kids unleash every single flipping day of their life, meaning, inspiration, and joy. And so I've learned all about life by seeing it led well by my, through my kids' lives. And so I've, I've just enjoyed watching them love, watching them experiment, watching them play, watching them climb, watching them fall, watching them get back up and do it again. Because we adults are, we're less likely to really climb. We're less likely to get back up when we fall. And we're even far less likely to move forward afterwards. So kids just have this incredible resiliency that we think we need to teach, but I think we already have it. And kids are, kids are examples of that. What, what am I struggling with, with them? Man, I just think as we move faster into life, it's very easy to lose sight of the things and the people that matter most in our lives. And so behind me, Larry, it's my family wall. 
So you're in my office right now. Actually, my office is about a mile away from my home. I live a mile from here, but every day I come here, obviously during quarantine, I'm here all by myself. So there's eight empty offices around me. Behind you is our podcast wall. It's people that I've interviewed that just wow me. To your right are individuals throughout history, like Martin Luther King Jr. and Oscar Romero, Mother Teresa, and Abraham Lincoln, and just like, oh, these massive historical figures. But sometimes we, because in every picture up there, I have them with a child. We sometimes forget, like, they're kind of ordinary people. They did extraordinary things, no doubt, but they did it one by one, one deposit at a time. So that's a reminder of what greatness looks like and how you get there. Just love the one in front of you. And then the wall behind me is why I work. So I have a picture of my wife and kids and family trips and my parents, my siblings, grandparents on both sides. Like, it's our family tree. That's my motivating force that guides me out of this office. But what it guides me toward frequently is flights. So I'm on and off planes, in and out of hotel rooms, in front of large venues, speaking at conferences around the world, which I love. But this season has allowed me to slow down for now 71 consecutive days, 72 as of tomorrow, 73 after that. To who, who's counting though? I mean, me, man. And I'm making a notch <laughs> on my bed, loving every single day because I used to track in a celebratory way how busy I was. And that's the exact opposite thing to be tracking in life. It matters not at all. In fact, it may be the opposite of success. When, when you ask a friend, how's he doing? And he says, busy. And he smiles like, aren't I cool? Man, we, we got to challenge that a little bit because it might be the opposite of effective. So I've had 71, 72 days at home where I've been professionally challenged like never before. But we're also beginning to scale in ways we never thought possible before. All of this while making breakfast and lunch and dinner every single day for my kids, making time for ping pong and basketball and walking the dog around the block and nightly drink, sipping wine on the screen porch with my wife. It has been one of the most remarkable times of our entire marriage. I love hearing that, man. I did a podcast not too long ago on busy as a four letter word now. Like, you know, it's busy as the new lazy. As soon as I hear busy, I'm like, oh man, this poor guy that I'm talking to probably isn't, isn't reflecting on the gratitude or the moments or the things that are going on. And we all get caught in that loop. I'm, I'm right there with you, man. I mean, like crazy busy, lots of demands on time. But I think if you don't stop, like I, you're a spiritual person, so am I. I feel like in a way, this whole quarantine thing is a tap on the shoulder from God saying, hey, slow down for a minute. Just just remember some of the basics. And for the next however many days, I would, I would like to think we're coming to an end of it. But reflect on the things that worked before we got so crazy busy. And mm. it sounds like you have, I mean, not that you're counting or anything, <laughs> but this has been a really powerful thing for you to walk through as well, personally. Well, on many levels. One is just reconnecting. So that's one piece. The other thing is the tap from God. It's all a tap in my mind, and uh, not only the good, but also the difficult. How we respond to that matters, but also how we instill that into our beliefs long-term matters even more so. So my, my fa- grandfather's from the greatest generation. And there was a lunch we had, Larry, where I won't go into all the details, but as I'm challenging him on why he's doing the things he is with charity, he eventually says to me, John, do you know why they call us the greatest generation? Tell me, Grandpa. He said, well, it's not because we endured the Great Depression. Anybody tries to get through a bad time. It's not because we fought in World War II. When your very nation is attacked and evil is coming closer toward your borders, you rise, you stand up, and you fight forward. And it's not because we built the most successful society in the history of the world once we returned home. So what is it, Grandpa? He said, John, it is that we never forgot the lessons being taught along the way. The Great Depression taught us to be grateful for everything. The Great Depression taught us that debt is maybe not your friend. That savings is not a bad idea, that you need your family more than you thought you did, and you certainly need a little bit of faith. The the war taught us that when evil shows up, you fight back. It taught us what sacrifice and selflessness actually looks like in action. And when we came back, John, we built that society, not just for ourselves out of ego, but we built it for the society itself, itself. So we ourselves could expand because we learned along the lessons the entire way what actually matters. And so all of that to say, this is a difficult season. Some of us are able to come home for 71 days and have sandwiches with the kids poolside. 
Others are struggling with PTSD as they fight in, in Corona units in hospitals. Others are losing family members. In New York, it's still locked down and it's going to be locked down for quite a while, man. This is a very, very, very difficult season. And I'm not trying to draw light out of it right now. But it's also a season where we can draw some incredible applicable lessons that will change the individual lives who are learning this right now. And also, I believe, society as a whole afterwards. So you use this as a season to be redeemed, to realize what matters, and then to put that into play once we return to, in quotes, normal. Because the normal days are coming. And I don't know if that's June or June of 2021. But normal's coming back, and I hope we don't return, return to normal with it. I agree. I hope we don't return to the quote unquote norm either because we, we just went through. Um, so we, we run a, a large mastermind community for dads. And just last week we, we took the men through the extra, through an exercise, start, stop, keep. And the, the, the challenge and the question and the reflection was all about, as you reflect upon what we've been through over the past 73 days, what are some things you're going to start doing when this normalizes that you haven't done before? What are some things that you're going to stop doing that didn't serve you in the first place? And out of this entire experience, the good things, as you reflect upon the good things, what are you going to keep moving forward? Mm -hmm. And just some of the ideas and some of the, some of the things that people have experienced on a really profound level. Yes, there's a lot of things that are challenging us right now. But at the same time, there's a lot of amazing gifts that if you just look for them, they're, they're there and you take that productive pause and you just reflect. So thank you again for the reminder on that. Yeah. So your new book, not that the first one wasn't a game changer. You got this new book out, came out last week, uh, but it's called In Awe. And I, I love the fact that you acknowledge, appreciate, highlight the lessons that you've learned from your kids. But one thing that you state in this book is kids are fearless. They're fearless and they're questioning. Take us through how we can take that as a lesson as adults. Mm. So, Larry, what, what I'm seeing with adults is we frequently endure the day. We endure work. We get through this lousy relationship I'm stuck in right now. We get, I mean, spring's here, but uh, in, in 11 months, I get to take my next vacation. And it's like, you're missing life. You are missing life. And then you see children skip into the room. You yeah. see them with their shoulders back. You see them with their smiles on. You see them reflecting joy. Yeah. We, we pursue happiness. Kids reflect joy. There's a difference. We'll spend a whole hour on some podcast if you ever want unpacking the gap between those two pieces. But, but kids are just in awe for life. And so I, I wrote this book in part because I saw it in my kids and in every other single child I'd, I'd encountered. But I also realized my kids were going to lose this. And I wanted them to have a love letter to be reminded of what they currently are teaching when they forget that they can reapply. And one of the things is the gift of wonder. Like kids yeah. just wonder, man. And, you know, in the book, we re refer to it as first time living, just like first time living. For them, everything is a first time experience. The walk around the block, when you and I walk around the block, Larry, it's a, it's a good three minutes to get from the front door back to the front door. With a child in tow, it's 36 minutes because every leaf, every rock, every earthworm, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And I think life is a big deal. And we, we, we keep our heads down and we miss it. So um, one of the other things that come out of first time living is inquisitiveness. Kids are curious about everything. And their favorite question by far is why? 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 All they do, they just want to know why. And after you and I get asked a million times, we're like, just because, now go to bed. You know, like and the door slams. So that's the end of that night. But I think the ask is important. When we adults ask questions, we frequently do it because we already know the answer we hope to see. In particular, when it's someone we disagree with politically or with religion or with leadership, we ask people questions not to get insight, but to uh, get evidence that we're right. Kids ask it from a place of pure, unadulterated curiosity. They just want to know why. Why are things the way they are? And is there even a better way to operate? And it leads to, uh, it's ultimately creativity and innovation. You know, nothing that is invented today was previously invented. Not a single thing. Not the phone that you and I are using right now. Not the microphones in front of us. Not the headset on your head. Like nothing. And so can we imagine what is possible going forward as a man, as a leader, as an organization, as a country, as a global community? Man, I think we need far greater imagination as we look forward than what we've experienced looking backward. 
So I, I think the idea of playing as a child does, asking questions, why, who says, and what if, and why not, might change what we currently have into something far better going forward. Dude, I love that. <laughs> I don't know if your kids think you're like super old, but my oh. kids give me crap about it all the time. They're like, wait, wait, wait a second. So you had a phone that was attached to your wall? Yes. And I'm like, yeah, we couldn't put phones in our pocket and it had a cord. And if you were, if you were, uh, if you were, uh, what was it cursed with one of those rotary phones took like 30 minutes to dial, you know, somebody's number. Right. And then you and, messed up the, the six <laughs> number. You're like, yeah. Yeah. And it was <laughs> the zero long distance used to take the better part of 25 minutes. And if you messed up one of the numbers back to scratch people. So yes, yeah. you're, you're right. Yeah. And, but, but we say this a lot, right? The reason, that, like you said, the headphones, the technology, just the things, things, it all because it was all because someone was able to have wonder and imagination and question like, well, how might we, if we wanted to have a phone that we could carry around, how, how might we do that? Right. Yes. So I think that, that that's really important. In your book, you also mentioned returning to childlike behavior seems counterintuitive to those to, to people in the workplace. But this is important. It's very important. Can you tell us why it's important? Sure. So, I mean, let's first make sure we are understanding the word childlike, not childish. I think we have plenty of <laughs> childish behavior in the workforce, in our medical force, in our politics, we won't go through name dropping right now because half of you will hate me and the other half will cheer for me until I drop the other side of the party. And now all of you will hate me. But we see lots of evidence of childish behavior from our leaders. We don't need that. We need childlike behavior. We need awe. I was, I was listening today with my kids. I always try to give a little history lesson before dad takes off. And today we're watching a speech of Kennedy. And, you know, whether you want to hate Kennedy or love him, the speech he gave on September 12th to 1963 at Rice University, when he basically said, we are going to the moon. We are going to the moon. It is one of the most remarkable speeches ever given. The tone, the way he talked about the challenges that we will face, how we'll have to create technologies don't, that don't yet even exist. And yet by the end of the decade, we will send a man to the moon and we will do it not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And to, I mean, it is an incredible childlike message that was achieved. So today's we're dealing with coronavirus and we're blaming Trump or we're blaming Pelosi or we're blaming China or we're blaming our governor or my spouse or my lousy parents growing up or whatever we're blaming this on now. That's not effective. What is effective is, man, how do we come together to see what is and what could be and then say, let's go. Let's go. No more excuses. What is the moon we are currently choosing? Because I haven't heard on either side of the aisle lately someone with a moonshot thought. We, we talk about how do we protect what I currently have. I'm not sure that's moonshot thinking. I, I want someone to come along and say, man, we choose the freaking moon. Not because it's easy, but because it's hard. I think a lot of it boils down to what questions are we asking ourselves and what questions are we asking of those around us, right? Of how, how might we instead of why can't we? I just want to share a quick story with you of, of how this showed up for us in Easter. For the past 24 years, I've known my wife. We've done the same thing on Easter every single year. We go to her extended families. There's 70 people there. There's about 30 kids there, all the way from newborn, all the way to probably 35 years old. Adults are catching up, having a great time. The Easter bunny shows up. The kids you know, separate and they go on their Easter egg hunt. Like it's, it's, it's something we look forward to every year. This year, we couldn't do that. And my wife and I woke up on, on the morning of Easter and we started asking ourselves really poor questions. Why can't we have Easter like, a, like it always is? Why can't we see the family? This really sucks. Like we, why can't we have the Easter egg hunt that the kids are so used to? Why can't they see? And then all of a sudden we started going deeper and deeper down this like sort of depressive state of why can't we? And then my wife and I just kind of called an audible over coffee and we said, you know what, how might we connect on a level that we've never connected as a family and do things we've never done on Easter? And at the end of the day, we high five each other and we did it right. What would that day look like? And we did things, John, like we played, um, would you rather over dinner? We played flag football in the backyard. My wife actually was the quarterback. We played flag football as a family. We did uh, take our kids through an Easter egg hunt through our, through our yard. We then watched a really cool movie as a family that night, but there was so much laughter and there was so much fun and it didn't start that way, but it all boiled down to that, that same thing, like that childlike 
curiosity of like, hey, uh, how, if, if we could do something, like, what would it be? Like, let's think about it. That simple idea of reframing the tone. That's all yeah. you did. You just reframed. And I, I hate to just keep beating up our friends in politics, but there's a way to come together and reframe this in the freest country in the history of the world with more wealth than, than could have been fathomed a few generations ago. There's a way to resolve the issues, but it will not be done by throwing darts, bullets, missiles, or whatever, tweets across the aisle. And so that's true politically. It's true in corporate America. It's true around the world. It's true in our families if we're not careful. So the fact that you and your wife reframed what you were experiencing into, how might we? How might? That's powerful. That is so good. Yeah, how might we? It's it's a good it's a good question, and, and like and right in line with with your book, right? At, at being gen- genuinely curious about the world around you, what could be possible? Um, you know, in, in your book, you also talk about um, you talk about a an experience with uh, another boy who you mention in the book is Curtis, correct? Mm-hmm. And what's crazy stories? Yeah, yeah, and, and this this story was was most, it seemed like it was, it was very meaningful to you. And uh, can you share what that story illustrates? <laughs> well, shoot, uh, there's a lot there to unpack. Yeah. The first part of it is this, what, what, it, what matters is I got a text when I was leaving an airport on the West Coast and it said, hey, John, one of our financial advisors that we work with, uh, his dear friend's son went through the windshield of their car uh, they'd read your book on fire. Would you keep them in your thoughts and prayers? So all I did was I said in my text, absolutely. Let me know their names. Let me know their address. And as soon as I return back to St. Louis, it's on. I will, I will reach out to them. I'll write them a love letter and I'll keep them in my thoughts and prayers. And so we do that a lot. And I always include my phone number and email. And if people need anything, I try to be there to serve them. And at the end of a very long day, I find myself landing first in Atlanta, hopping on another flight. I'm boarding this plane. I'm looking down at my phone and I, the, the gentleman gets back to me with the address and it's in Jackson, Mississippi. Well, what, what does that mean? Well, for the very first time in my entire life, the flight was leaving that night from Atlanta. It was going to land in about 45 minutes in a city I'd never been in called Jackson. So as it turns out, I happen to be in the same city that evening as this family I think that's an appointment that you have to say yes to and you get to say yes to as everything is. It's all a tap on the shoulder, but you got to say yes. So I, uh, I wrote back and said, hey, man, I'm in town. Will you please get me their cell phone so I can reach out? And a very long, beautiful story made a little bit more short for the interest of your friends being able to have dinner at some point this week. <laughs> the following day, I got to meet this family. I got to hang with Curtis. He was a little boy who was probably going to die. He was, if he did survive, he was going to be blind. He had all these challenges in front of him. And uh, there was a bit of hopelessness that was creeping in with the healthcare staff and the family. And I begged them to not let that creep in and to not only that, but let the family see him, let the little siblings hug on their kid, their brother again. And man, <laughs> the following weekend, I get a video from mom and dad saying, hey, John, we thought you might want to see this. And it's two little siblings. They were maybe five and three seeing their brother who was almost comatose, but not quite. But he was awake, but he could not see. And so these little kids are coming into this room. It's all on on tape. It's unbelievable. And the little boy blindly hears their voices. So he reaches out. He pulls them close. Then he just pulls them both close with both arms. And the little boy in the hospital bed starts weeping. Then he lets go the heads of his siblings. He wipes his cheeks as if to say, all right. That's what I needed. It's on. The following week, I get another video from the dad. Again, this little boy should never see again. It, it, the eyes have been, the retinas have been completely detached. The following week, the little boy is now able to see. As he progresses forward, every week, dad sending me a new video, a new video, a new video. Weeks and weeks in, I get a video of Curtis playing flag football with his siblings in the backyard. And then at the end of the story, I, sh- I shared that I was in uh, a community in Louisiana, Lafayette, Louisiana, and uh, speaking to a school. And it was a group of fourth graders through 12th graders. Curtis was in third grade, by the way. But uh, I was in, speaking to fourth graders through 12th graders. And I shared the story of when John O'Leary came back to the t- came back to school, how important it was that he felt loved, that they actually had a parade in my honor. And it changed the way not only they engaged with me, but I felt about myself. And then I shared the story of Curtis. And I said, you know what? He's actually thinking of coming to school here next year. Wouldn't that be cool if he ever decides to come here, you had a parade like that for him. 
And the kids were just, you know, seniors in high school, man, you know, those guys, like it's hard to get them fired up. They were fired up. The room was rocking. And then I said, oh yeah, one more thing that's kind of cool. He's actually here with me today, checking out the school. Would, would you guys like to meet Curtis right now? You know, it's 900 kids in this room and they all come to their feet. And then this little third grade boy, now with glasses, a little bit of a limp, rises, comes to the podium, gives a sweet, humble wave. Everybody's in tears. Mom and dad are there. The crowd is buzzing, man. It's one of the most meaningful experiences I've ever been part of. And what led to that? Uh, you, you said, Jonathan, is, is this a way of God kind of tapping you on the shoulder? And I said back, yes, but everything is. Everything is a way of being tapped on the shoulder, but you got to be aware of the tap. And then you got to be aware of saying yes afterwards. You, you can't say yes to everything because then you say no to the things that matter most. But man, I, I, I just think we got to be open to that voice, open to that tap and open to our yes, because it can change a life. All right, John. That's twice on this podcast. You got me choked up here, buddy. Um, that's, that's an amazing story, John. I mean, I'm not giving you, I'm not giving it justice because the story played out over a year and a half yeah. of long conversations and videos going back and forth. And I, I will send you, you can put it in the show notes, the video of little Curtis seeing for the first time, please. And dads, when you watch this video, if you don't see love and if you're not moved, you don't have a heart, you need to check your pulse immediately and, and drive yourself quickly to the <laughs> ER because it's, it's, it is by far the most emotional thing I've ever witnessed a little boy not being judged, but being held by his little siblings and then recognizing love, love can conquer. Dude, that is a very powerful story. <laughs> I, that, that is amazing. I, I knew a little bit about it. I didn't know that much about it though. That's, that is, that is very powerful. Gentlemen, we are talking to John O'Leary, his new book in awe, rediscover your childlike wonder to unleash inspiration, meaning, and joy. Last thing I want to talk, talk to you about John is this challenge, this challenge. Men love challenges, right? So in awe, 21 day challenge. Tell us about this. Yeah. You know, our world fell apart back in March, like everybody else's as a, as a breadwinner, 94% of my revenue comes from speaking on the road. And I have now eight employees whose lives and, and families and mortgages and insurance, like it all is dependent upon this. And so that's a, a heavy weight. It's a sale when life is good. It's a heavy weight when everything pivots. And so I wanted to do a couple things. One is I wanted to serve them and remind them, hey guys, we can still do phenomenal work. We got to get after this. We got to change our focus. We got to go online full tilt and lead this. And so we got creative on a whole lot of processes, webcasts, webinars, coaching seminars, all the stuff that we're not doing because they realize we can do this together. And I'm proud to say that they have. They've done a phenomenal job leading forward. I think a lot of folks kind of go for safe harbor and we just put up the sale and moved in a different direction. The second thing we did is as a, as a community here at this office, we wanted our families to see generosity in action. I want them to recognize dad was kind when it was awesome out, but he was also kind when it was a thunderstorm. And so what we did is we decided, man, 100% of the sales for the first, all pre-sales and for the first entire week of, of the sales for the book in all, we'll go to Big Brothers, Big Sisters. I wanted to make a difference for an, or, for an organization that does more good than anybody else I know. So for these kids, the amount of food they provide, the amount of healthcare they help them with, the amount of love they provide, the amount of joy, and just the example they are, the lives they change. And so 100% of the profits from the book in awe went to Big Brothers Big Sisters. So I wanted my kids to see that. And I wanted our team to realize we're not going to clam up during the storm. We're going to keep the sail high. We're going to race into this thing. We're going to touch lives along the way. And so I'm, I'm super excited and proud that we have been able to do that. And then thirdly, we wanted to shine light into the darkness. Like I told you earlier, last year, 1.5 million Americans attempted suicide. And that was when markets were at all-time highs and unemployment at all-time lows. So it scares the heck out of me, but also inspires the heck out of me to want to do more. So we created the 21-day challenge as a way to meet people where they are, to remind them they're not alone, that little steps can make a mighty difference if they keep taking them, and that their best days remain in front of them. So that launched back in early March. And Larry, I think we've had 10 or 20,000 people roll through this thing. And many people go through a second time where they invite friends to journey with them. And so I'm, I'm excited to see what that has done and what we think it's going to continue to do going forward. So yeah, I'm going to sign up as soon as we're done here. Uh, John, 
I don't know if you've, if anyone has shared this with you, but since I've got, I got to hear the choice that your dad basically laid before you when you were 10, when you Mm -hmm. were asking like, why can't life be like this? Why can't like, I just want to do this. I just want to do that. And he gave you that choice without shitting on you. Right. We said that earlier. And I just want to recognize you for a second, man. Um, We're in really uncertain times right now. You just launched a new book. You've got eight people that are on your staff. You 94% of your revenue as a business comes from speaking, which last time I looked, most speaking events and conferences are canceled. Yet here you are donating the profits from this to help another organization in probably one of the most uncertain times that we could possibly have. I just want to explore that for just a minute because I think it's it's really powerful. And plus the curiosity in me is just wondering, well, why would you do that? <laughs> now you sound like my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and, and let me answer that on a couple different ways. One is because you are in, we, I'll, I'll own this. I feel as if I am called to be generous when I have it and when I don't. I don't personally know a whole lot of people who go broke being generous, being kind. I think in ways we cannot fathom. Uh, sometimes in dollars and other times in far more worthy ways, it comes back into your life. So that, that's one piece. Secondly, I, I'm a board member for Big Brothers Big Sisters. And as I'm thinking about my woes, and there are many, uh, I was on this call listening to our executive director, who I think is the finest executive out of any business I've ever managed, read, read about, worked with, or anything else. A couple thousand businesses we partnered with. I don't know any better than Becky James Hatter, executive director in St. Louis of Big Brothers Big Sisters. And she was just sharing what they're up against. And she wasn't sharing it from like, our uh, revenues have been cut and uh, you know state funding is going to go down. Her take was, these kids are in a crisis right now. They used to go to school to get fed. Forget about school for a moment. They went for food, man. And now our job is to get out there on the road and meet these kids where they are. And she just kept unpacking the need. And in that the, the call, I just said, you guys like, I'm just feeling called. I got I to gotta do something. I want to talk about it. I want to make a difference. And I don't want to just write about it or say, hey, Larry, you should be generous. I want to lead. I want to be an example this time. So that's what sparked it. And I, I wanted my kids to see it. And, that, and finally, I learned all this from my kids. During a different season, when O'Leary was a little bit more flush with cash, I came back from a speaking event. I was gone for three days, three different speaking events, three different book lines, and a whole lot of greens in my pocket, man. So I'm at church on a Sunday with my little kids. And what they don't realize is speak, like that money doesn't stay in my pocket. Eventually, it goes back to the book retailers. But for a season, it's mine. And then I got to distribute a portion of it back. But he saw this wallet that was stacked. And they're passing the, ba- the basket around church. And so I whispered to Patrick. Patrick's five or six. I say, hey, Patrick, how much should we give? You know, 20, 40, we give digitally because I want to I want to be intentional on the front side of the year, dad. So that's one way to make sure that you uh, you're mindful of what you're able to give. I think if you give from what you have left, you'll find yourself giving very little. But if you give from the first fruits, if you give on the front side of the year, on the front side of every paycheck, you'll find oh, I gave far more than I thought I could. So I, I encourage you all first pay back into society whether you're at a church or synagogue or not-for-profits. Secondly, pay yourself. I know it's a financial lecture, but here we go. Pay yourself. And then whatever is left over from whatever percentage you've chosen to give away, spend it. Have fun, man. Go to the, go, go to the ice cream shop with that, but don't do it in reverse order because you'll get it backward. So my, my kids are seeing me flush with cash and I'm asking Patrick, how much should I give? And he whispers back as loud as you can possibly roar, Daddy, give it all. And like that word all echoes throughout all of church. And I realized I'm doomed. I just got to do what he's, uh, what he's requesting. So I gave it all. I wanted Patrick to see his dad listen to him back then when he had money. But I wanted his, son, his same son now to, at a different season because we're talking candidly around the dinner table about what's happening. But I also wanted Patrick and his siblings to see daddy being generous during a season when we have far less. So um, that's my story. If I could just step into the shoes of <clears throat> your amazing father for just a moment, and those are really big shoes, by the way, to fill. But I think your dad would have said the same thing to you that he did back then is nobody blame you if you decided to not give to a charity or not give to the church. I mean, we're in uncertain times and nobody blame you. Yet, here you are again, stepping in and making a choice to do otherwise. So... 
that's a great example. That's a great reminder to all of us. And, and thank you for that powerful reminder. Just a, a couple cool things that are happening. One is organizations around our community now are stepping forward and writing big checks to Big Brothers Big Sisters. I didn't do it for that. But apparently, good begets good, man. So it's, it, it attracts. It, it does attract. So that is really cool to know that that is happening. They're seeing a spike in, in volunteers actually wanting to raise their hand and show up, which is unexpected and amazing. We had, candidly, our best revenue week last week since this crisis began. I just think that's a way of God tapping your other shoulder and saying, try it out, give me. Go and try. I, I dare you. I gave you back your life at nine. Try, try to do something bigger than that. And so I, I've been trying to respond appropriately and accordingly uh, since I really woke up in my late 20s. And I'm still trying to get up a little bit higher each day. But I think it's really hard to outgive someone who gave you everything. So I'm not, um, <laughs> you know, like on the front of my books, man, I, there's not a picture of me because I'm not the star of the stories. I, I realize though, as a community, we are called to give together. And what I have this season, I may not next. And how cool to think there's going to be brothers and sisters in the community that will support me and my family. We're not alone. And so I, I recognize that. And, and um, I hope we all do. And in a period of time where so many of us feel like we're doing life by ourselves, you're not alone. You are worthy. Like it, the, the biggest mistake I made, Larry, when you and I were friends in high school and for decades afterwards is the belief that I was not worthy. And that's a crock of of should, man. So back to you. <laughs> so you are worthy. You are enough. And the more we recognize that, the more of an impact we can have collectively. Yeah. Man. So needed this today, man. I hope you and the audience, you guys needed it as well. Is there anything that we left out? Anything that is that is really, really important to you that we didn't get to today? <laughs> That's a loaded question. I mean, I think we talked about marriage, singleness, high school, grade school, burns, recovery, children, parenting, Parkinson's disease, cancer, childhoods going through, windshields, bouncing back, regaining sight. Man, we, we had a marathon in one hour and it was awesome. And I'm not even tired. So I, I, I credit you. I think your interview style is awesome. It's many people come into an interview with 17 bullets and you touch all 17 and you're done. And it seems like you generally know where you want to go, but you don't care how you get there. Yeah. I always feel like there's, I, I thank you, by the way, man, I'm, I'm seriously touched and humbled by that. Uh, but I, I just feel like it's, it's going to go where, where it's supposed to go. Right. You know, you know? <laughs> so I appreciate you doing that. Well, yeah. Again, man, ego is thinking at you. And, and uh, when you can edge away from that a little bit, it's realizing that all we have to do is say yes and be yeah. real, be authentic, don't have an agenda, just step into every meeting authentically. There's sort of the one in front of you. And through that profound success shows up in your life, shows up in your marriage, shows up in your singleness. And maybe that's a story I'll share as we wrap up. It's yeah. Anything yeah. you want to share? Because a lot of the dads are trying to figure out how to be a better dad. A lot of the leaders, ladies who are listening and trying to figure that out better. And what is true is what you focus on grows. And if you're focused on the headlines, you will see coronavirus growing, recessionary winds growing, despair growing, hopelessness growing, and death growing. So that's one thing you could choose to focus on. But I, as I get ready to leave you and you guys get ready to leave, live your own lives, in, in 2016, we had our best year ever professionally, but my marriage wasn't as good as I'd hoped it might be. So the following year in 2017, I committed to tracking one beautiful thing about my wife every day. So every single day, I would look for one thing in, in my wife Beth, that she did, something she said, uh, something she wore, something we did together, something she did for a kid or a neighbor or whatever, and then just track it. I kept a journal entry, Dear Beth, and then I would write what she did. And I never told her. So for 360 days, I tracked my wife's beauty. And then on Christmas morning, 2017, gave her an old crappy leather stained, you know, coffee stained, beer stained, everything stained journal. She opens it and she reads January 1, Dear Beth. Beth, this year I wanted to track. And then it goes on from there. And it's first time ever tears of joy happen on Christmas morning. I've given her a lot of cruddy presents, but that was the best present I've ever given her as a spouse. And it wasn't like she had to wait for Christmas to open it. And, and looking for the good in Beth all year long, I found it every day. And it changed the way I loved her. And so what, why does that matter to you guys? Listen, if you're trying to be a better dad, focus on the good. 
it, it's very easy to focus on what they're not doing right. And it's popular these days. So I, I encourage you, if you track the good around you and then you record that and then you celebrate that and share it, you will be in awe at the good that comes back, not only into their life, but back into yours. John. Dude, I remember when you came on the show, this was back in, I think, 2007, it might've been 2016. And you shared that, what you were doing for, for Beth. And I'll, I'll never forget that. And that is just such an incredible, because not only obviously, like you said, is that an amazing gift for her, but daily through that discipline, you're changing the way that you love someone who's important to you in their life. Right. I just think that's such a phenomenal practice. So gentlemen, again, we're talking to John O'Leary, uh, his new book in awe, rediscover your childlike wonder to unleash inspiration, meaning, and joy. And these are stories that th these are lessons that he has learned from his own family. And in this book, he shares several stories, uh, just how we can be more curious about the world, you know, not, not be fearful to ask better questions, um, to be creative and, 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 and lots more. And gentlemen, make sure you guys join me in, in this challenge that John has created. It's called the In Awe 21 Day Challenge. I'll have a link for you in the show notes as well. Just go to gooddadproject.com forward slash 277 for this episode. Again, gooddadproject.com forward slash 277 for the book, for the challenge, the whole nine yards. John, it's giving me chills to say this, but thank you from the bottom of my heart. This was like food for the soul for, <laughs> for so many of us. And thank you for, for coming on and thanks for what you're doing out there, man. It's very meaningful work. Man, you, you're scaling this through your, your work. So keep going. And uh, it's an honor to be your friend and to be one of your cheerleaders. Back at you, my friend. And, and dude, high school, come on, man. We're here. High school. We're Spartans, baby. We Spartan nation continues to touch lives. The crazy thing is, as we wrap up here, John, 2021, dude, that is going to be, is that 25 years? Right? I was told there'd be no math during this podcast. So I know, I'm right? Gonna fall for it now. I think my head's hurting right now, like the high school reunion year we're on, because I remember us walking with the cap and gown, and here we are, you know, years and years later. So, but again, man, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, Larry, thank you again. Thank you, listeners. You bet. <laughs> 